standing outside. Do you mind coming in now, please? Right. Somebody poke those guys. <laughs> All right, okay, so uh, let's welcome Professor Sunil Andrabar from Columbia University. Uh, he works in rehabilitation robotics, is that fair to say? His name, his lab's name is Roar, which, which I always remember, and, and Roar is robot, uh, robotics and rehabilitation lab. Uh, he also works on exoskeletons, so we're very pleased to have him here. And, uh, and it talk about how he retrains uh, human movements using robots. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Purvar Nidanjan. Thank you for inviting me to, to this uh, meeting. I think it's, I've learned a lot today, and I think uh, I hope to, again, continue learning it tomorrow as well. So, um, um, so I, I have a robotics uh, background, just like Michael Carthy, I guess, uh, so silly colleagues, I guess. Um, about 10 years ago, I, before I moved to Columbia University, I was working at the University of Delaware. And we had a lot of uh, great uh, physical therapists. And uh, they were working on various patient rehabilitation. And uh, I got friendly with them. And uh, that sort of really uh, you know, spurred me into, into this direction. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, things that we have done in the last seven years or so at Columbia, and Columbia sort of uh, provides a, a great environment uh, with uh, medical faculty and engineering and so forth. Um, so theme of uh, a lot of work that we do is uh, basic uh, development of uh, machines and technology, but uh, we go to the next step where we not only sort of uh, are happy with the design of the technology, but actually create uh, patient studies to see how these uh, technologies and machines can actually help uh, people with uh, real disabilities. So just a little background. Uh, we know that we have an aging world today, right? Uh, a little bit of data here from the United Nations. Uh, these are some fresh data about 2015 or so. Uh, tells you uh, how the demographics is changing towards uh, um, kind of aging people. So if you think of, let's say, 2015, right? Uh, what you see here is that, uh, again, this is across various continents, I mean, America, Europe, Asia, and so forth. And you see that uh, there's a certain number of people 65 years or older, right? But if you sort of fast forward about 2050, you see these numbers sort of uh, grow, grow exponentially. Just to kind of give you a sense of it, uh, for every 65 year older, right? Right now we have seven to eight younger people to sort of take care of them. Okay, but if you go to 2050, that number sort of goes down to five for every older person. Right? So if uh, we ourselves cannot take care of the elderly, somebody has to, right? And that's where hopefully the technology sort of comes in, takes place. Um, and we know that uh, old, of course, uh, is associated with many things. Decline in sensory, musculoskeletal, cognition, right? And these are all sort of issues that are there for our aging society. Uh, this is another quick slide, also taken from the United Nations uh, um, uh, WHO source. This just sort of gives you a brief snapshot of uh, what are some of the uh, main reasons why people do not are not able to work. Right. So this is years lost to disability. Right. So for some reason or the other, people had to lose work. And if you look at the top reasons for female and male. Right, a lot of these are sort of we can uh, sort of associate uh, hearing loss, back pain, Alzheimer's, osteoarthritis, falls, cataracts, and so forth. Right, and the same goes for men as well. Right, so these are again, I mean, it's um, um, it's not sort of uh, something unusual. Now, this another data here. It says that today more than one billion people in the world need assistive technology. Right, and it's a breakdown of uh, various technologies. About 970 million people need glasses and low vision aids. Right? 75 million people need wheelchairs. 150 million people need mobility aids. Right? 35 million people need prosthesis and autosis. Right? Another 150 million people need cognitive aids. Right? Just kind of uh, these numbers, I mean, these are societal numbers. 
and this is something that's uh, a prevalent thing in, in our society. Also, there are uh, people who die, so a number of years of life loss, right? So these are premature deaths of people, right? And some of the uh, uh, things that you see here, uh, kind of heart diseases, stroke, and, and so forth, right? And stroke uh, is something that uh, is, uh, um, um, we as roboticists can actually make a difference in. So a quick snapshot of things that we do in our laboratory, right? Uh, we look at uh, patients. A lot of them with stroke. Some we have who have a spinal cord injury. We're going to go through some of the details. Um, patients with Parkinson's disease. A lot of older people fall down, right? That's, as we saw in the statistics, that's a big thing. Cognitive issues, Alzheimer's and things like that. And where we, we as robotics that come in and, and do things. Children with various kinds of uh, uh, congenital diseases like cerebral palsy and things like that. Um, these are uh, uh, children who got say abnormal curvature of the spine, sometimes called scoliosis, right? Where they will undergo uh, uh, treatment and so forth. These are some patients with ALS who may have uh, kind of, uh, poor control of the neck, right? Because in ALS, what happens is that you progressively lose all your muscular capability, and only thing that sort of remains is your eye movements, right? So if you can kind of connect with what you. I've seen in video the Stephen Hawking, right? He was sitting in a wheelchair and used his eyes to sort of uh, communicate. So for people with uh, ALS, head drop becomes a big issue as well, right? So this is how they are, right? They won't be able to sort of uh, come and look, look at you and things like that. So here are sort of a range of technologies that we have designed in our laboratory and we kind of uh, work with them. And many of these uh, technologies are designed based on the principles that can you and I sort of uh, look at roboticists, uh, whereas technology, kind of body variable things, uh, and I'm going to motivate some of these things, exoskeletons, some of these wire driven robotic systems, and, and things like that. Um, so what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to walk you through a few of these sort of examples, right, uh, um, and the kinds of studies that we do with them, and what we have found out so far, and where we feel that robotics sort of can, can make a difference. So the way uh, we all sort of see that the brain is an apparatus that can learn, right, regardless of uh, the nature of the disease, right? And uh, we think of robots as training wheels on a bicycle, right? So think of a child who's trying to learn to bike, right? In the beginning, the person doesn't have a balance, or the baby doesn't have balance. And what you do is you put a training wheel on the bicycle, right? And you use the training wheel to eventually sort of help, help them sort of gain the balance. And then you must sort of throw, take away the training wheels. So that's how we see robotics as well. We don't think of robotics as something that could be assistive device all throughout their life or lifespan. Okay. But we think of this as a way to re kind of generate or kind of re uh, um, sort of uh, energize the, the brain to sort of uh, help them do their function better than better. So a lot of uh, insights into some of these things come out from our clinical partners as well, because uh, um, they, they sort of know the disease well, and we sort of think of how we as robotics can work back with them to, to make some of these So um, a little bit about why robotics, right? Um, and of course, this group probably knows uh, a lot better than, than others. Um, we know that robotics can help retrain movements by modulating forces. A lot of robots that we design can be kind of used to modulate forces. And, and this is what physiatrists often do when patients have an issue, right, and go, go, to, go, to, go to them, right. And so an appropriately designed machine can help or facilitate or augment what a physiatrist could do. Now, it turns out to be that a lot of technologies are out there, right? People sort of make technology and think that it'll work, right? But but I think learning is uh, is sort of uh, it's a it's it's a retraining of your motor system, right? So learning is not just sort of uh, giving somebody an aid and and they learn from it, but there is sort of a, a process where the brain sort of learns through repetitive kind of uh, there are theories of how how, how people learn. And we have to incorporate some of these ideas in the human interfaces that we design with the machines, right? And so, if you design these machines appropriately with some of these model learning principles 
into the into your interfaces, then there are high chances of success eventually with, with your goals. Now, now as academicians, okay, I like this part the best, right? We can ask a lot of what if questions, right? What robots do is allow you to sort of create a new environment where the machine and the human are sort of together. Right? And in this new environment, you can sort of uh, challenge or trick or kind of uh, work with the, with the human or neurovascular system. And you can ask the question, what will happen if I did this? Right? Would that have any benefit in terms of kind of training and learning and things like that? Right? And I, I'm, I'm going to show you a lot of, lot of this type of uh, thing here in, in my talk. Um, so the way I, I've kind of organized my talk, I'm going to have a few slides, right? Sort of walk you through, and then sort of have a little question and answer session, and kind of walk you through the next step. Because many of these uh, um, ideas are sort of a little bit kind of uh, they are they are intertwined, but on the other hand, they are separate, and, and we can sort of uh, take questions as you as you go along. So first, uh, a little bit about uh, stroke. I think many of you probably um, are familiar with, uh, with stroke, but, uh, um, but stroke is typically when the brain doesn't sort of get uh, uh, sort of your nutrients, right, blood, blood supply sort of gets uh, uh, sort of clogged, right, as a result of it, certain cells would die because they didn't have the nutrition, right, and, and what happens is that you would, those cells in the brain, Sort of connect and uh, and uh, um, are responsible certain for certain functions, right? So you temp temporarily have uh, lost function, then you have a permanent damage, and you have temporary damage. And basically, what's what's happening is that you have lost the interconnection between the brain and the muscles, which are basically coding it together. And and the question is, how can you sort of make that happen again, right? And and, and a typical. Uh, um, um, so just a little statistics here, about 4 million stroke survivors are in the United States. That's kind of giving a statistics here. We have 300 million people roughly in the United States, right? So about uh, 1 in 100 or so may suffer a stroke, right? And after a stroke, about say 70% of the people would actually survive, okay? But they would have uh, impairments of various kinds. Some of these impairments, I mean, they of course, they have functional impairments, balance, gait, walking, Right, your movement and things like that, but there may also be other kinds of impairments which are sort of speech related or uh, uh, sensory related and so forth. So it's a, it's a, it's a com complex problem where, where a lot of these things are intertwined together. But from a walking perspective, many of the survivors would have a one-sided weakness. Right? So a typical stroke patient may have actually a, a weak side, right? and that weak side could be sort of arms, legs together, and so when they are walking, they are not able to sort of uh, move that weak side as much as, as the good side. Right? So they have sort of a symmetry a lot in their movements, like right? gait, walking, arm movements, and things like that. And uh, and uh, uh, there are, there are certain sort of uh, typical features of stroke. For example, something called a foot drop. Right. So if you think of uh, walking, right. I mean, you normally sort of uh, uh, you, you kind of lift your foot up. Right. That's how you clear off the ground. Right. But many of the stroke patients will not be able to kind of pull their foot up, right? So that means they have a foot drop. So as they're walking, they drag their foot, right? So in order to sort of compensate for that, they have to sort of move their pelvis up. And so they kind of, you, you lift that side so that you can sort of uh, clear the foot of the ground. And, and, that, and those result in complications uh, such as toe drag, pelvic elevation, lack of balance, and they fall down and so forth. So many of times, your typical walking speed of a stroke patient may be one third or one fourth of what you, you see in a tangent age match you have a subject. Um, so this, I, I, I mean, there's a video that ran here. I mean, what you saw is that many of these patients would have to be sort of trained with multiple therapists. These are very time intensive, and kind of, kind of uh, uh, many people have to sort of uh, um, be there in kind of labor intensive positions to kind of rehabilitate these patients. Um, and of course, I mean, these are they result in a lot of back injuries to the clinicians. They're also expensive because time is expensive and so forth, and they don't get enough uh, adequate uh, time. For now, over the years, we, um, um, I mean, we started designing some of these exoskeletons for these two patients back in about 2005, 2006 or so, when I was at University of Delaware. And we had a whole series of these exoskeletons that we, that we uh, developed. I'm just going to uh, have uh, uh, a few of these videos that run out here. So here is uh, one of those uh, exoskeletons we call ALEX, which is an acronym for Active Leg Exoskeleton. 
And, and as you see here, they're walking on a treadmill. This is a machine that is connected to their leg, right? in, in this case, the weak leg. And what you do is you have joints on the machine, which you sort of uh, fine-tune to the joints of the actual human, human being. And, uh, and what you do is you interact between the machine and the human. Right? And, and the fundamental idea here is that uh, these patients may not be able to sort of can have a large uh, uh, gait, just like a healthy subject. And, and what you would do is create this forced interaction between the machine and the human based on the gait and some of the templates that, that you want, want to learn and so forth. Um, and, and of course, I mean, uh, this has evolved over the years. I mean, this is, uh, this is a, uh, an exoskeleton. This is a bilateral exoskeleton, which was fully motorized, but in this case, it was uh, only two degrees of active uh, uh, control, while other degrees of freedom were passive and, and so forth. So this is uh, Alex, Alex 2, Alex 3, and so forth. And, and we sort of involved in a, in a variety of different studies to see how you can uh, help the uh, patients uh, retrain their, their movements. And um, so, um, so one of the first, uh, uh, just to kind of get a sense of uh, what's happening here, right? I mean, of course, we, we want to sort of see if uh, a stroke patient, we can improve their gait pattern. And so the question was, uh, what will happen if I take a healthy adult and put him in this exoskeleton, would we be able to retrain the gait of healthy subjects? And it's kind of a, it's a fundamental question. It's kind of an interesting question, right? You and I, when, when we walk, we're not looking at our foot, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's sort of inbuilt into our neuromuscular system. And we are asking the question, can I take a person, let's say you and, you and I, put him in the exoskeleton, give him a new template of gait to walk on, right? And train with this force field to walk in this new template. And the question is, would you learn to, to walk in this new new template? Now, if you do, I think that is also a very interesting question, right? I mean, from, from a functional training perspective, from a sports training, and, and many, 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 many other things. Right, so this is a study that we did about 2007 or eight, or, and we published at, at, at there. And, then, and the paradigm out here is that uh, as you're walking, this is how your foot sort of moves. If I think of the ankle, respect to your, your pelvic frame, you essentially pull the foot backwards, bend your knee, come forward, and this is kind of a repetitive cycle. So this is a satchel plane, right? So basically when I'm walking, I'm basically pulling my foot up that kind of point, right? This is the cycle I'm in, right? So, so the question we, we asked is, if I take a healthy subject and ask them to walk in a new template, and what we did is, we took this template here, Right. And this phase of the gait here is where, where you kind of bend your knees. Right. So now what we want to do is, this is their gait, blue gait, and we want, want them to walk in this green gait. And what this green gait is basically telling them is that you don't flex your knees as much, and you take a longer step. Right. So this is sort of a, a not a natural gait for you and I. And, and we ask the question, if I were to train you with a force field, would you learn to walk with this new Right? And uh, the idea here is that, uh, so what we did is, uh, uh, the interaction between the machine and the human was that we create a little force feed. Okay, so if this is my green template that I want you to walk, and if you deviate from this template by a certain amount, we basically pull, apply a force normal to, to, to the template. Right? So if, I, if I'm out here, essentially I'm pushing you down the company. Okay. And and also, in addition to that, we provide you visual feedback of, of what you're doing. Right? So we, you look at the computer screen, how you're walking, and see if you can first kind of try to match the, the, the template. And this is what the person is trying to do. He's looking at the screen here, which has the green template. He's trying to actively modulate himself to walk. And of course, if you've got difficulty, you cannot sort of do that. Okay. Now we create a force field with a little kind of a tight tunnel. Right? As soon as it deviates more than three millimeters from the tunnel, basically you apply a normal force. Right? And as a, as a result of this applying this force, now you can see that it's kind of following this template. Right? After about 15 minutes of walking, we relax the template. Right? So instead of a three millimeter, now we sort of go to six millimeters. Right? And, and the person, you see here that even though you, and, 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 bit, and within the six millimeter, you don't get any force speed. Right? So we want you to sort of learn a little bit. Right? And only when you sort of uh, deviate from far away, then we sort of apply the force speed. So this six millimeters, this is eight millimeters. So they, you walk for 15 minutes in each of these conditions. And after that, we took up with the force field. Right? So this is how he was walking before. 
This is with the visual feedback. These are three training sessions with 15 minutes of force field. We turn the force field on and the person will walking after that. So here's how the person is walking after 45 minutes of this training, okay, when there is no force field. Okay. Let's look at this through a video. So this is how he was walking before. Okay. And this is how he was walking after. In both cases, there is no external force field. All the force field was during the training that happened in these 45 minutes. Right? And what you see here, the, per, the, the patient or the subject here is walking more or less the way he was asked to walk in this, uh, in, with this camera. Right? Any questions? Yeah? So, did you permanently change this person's gait? <laughs> Do you want your gait to be permanently changed? No, I don't. Not really. <laughs> And, and of course, I mean, these are healthy subjects. So, so the, uh, so, so again, so, so that was an interesting question, right? If I initiate this change, how long would this change last? Right? Because of course, we don't want to change it for, permanently. Um, any other question? <laughs> the answer for that. Yeah. So what we did is we. So this was just one 45 minute session, right? It's just one 45 minute session. Yeah. It's a single session of 45 minutes. Right? But we are trying to sort of ask the question, if I take a healthy brain, right, are we able to initiate this change, short-term change, with, with this kind of robotic training? Because if I cannot sort of do this short-term change with the healthy subjects, my chances of doing with stroke patients kind of far less. Right? So, so these are kind of proof of principle kind, kind of studies. So in order to ask the question, right, uh, what we did is we actually did 36 healthy subjects. So, of course, I mean, whenever you do these human studies, you don't do for one person, but you do a group and look at the group averages and data. And what we did is we divided these 30 subjects, 36 subjects, into three groups. One group was given only visual feedback, right? So it's only giving, giving, seeing the visual feedback, but no force feedback. The second group is only getting a force feed or force feedback if, if he or she is kind of deviating from, from the template. And the third group is given both visual and the force feedback. Right? And, uh, um, and the, the protocol was you start out with your uh, five minutes walking without any force field. Then you have six 10 minute training sessions with the force field, but kind of changing the force field parameters. You look immediately after you turn on the force field how you're walking. Then you have a retention test 10 minutes later. So we kind of let you sit out for, for 10 minutes and then have you walk. Then, you then we take you off from your from the robot, let you go have lunch, sort of come back after two hours and put you up. Right? And, and we want us to know what happened here versus these guys here in the three hours. Right? So this training was really to sort of initiate the change and we want to sort of look at uh, what happened. And what was very interesting here is uh, this is the kind of uh, pattern we saw. Okay, so this is the baseline, so again this is the same sagittal plane, forward, backward, up and down. This is the temporary the gate, the black one, that was the baseline template of the first Okay. What we did is we shrunk down the template by about 20% 20, 20 okay, both in the height, so this is kind of think of a height, this is the thing of the step leg. Okay. And we asked the person to be trained to this dashed black. And, and that, for, that 60 minutes of uh, uh, training was essentially given so that the person would actually change his template from here to here. Okay. Immediately after training, okay, this is the blue template. So, the, so overall, okay, the group was able to actually do a template close to what, what the group was trained for. After 10 minutes, they lost a little bit of that. Right? So we're coming back to, uh, to Anurag's question. To the, to the red gate. And after two hours, they have this green gate. Right? So, which you see here that, uh, uh, first of all, kind of we established a few things, is that, the, that overall the group was trained with this new template. Right? They were able to retain some of these changes for up to two hours, because we, we, our experiment was only done for two hours. Right? And, uh, um, and, and slowly you're kind of dissipating some, some of that. It's not too short of a time to test. Sorry? 
it's not too short of a time to be tested. Uh, what happened, for example, one week after that? Uh, well, you, no, most likely because these are all healthy subjects, so you would dissipate. But, but our protocol was that we only tested up to up to two, two hours. And, and I think it's on, a, on a high on a retrospect, I mean, you can say why not sort of we kind of test it next day or so. But we didn't do at that at, at that time, and we kind of decided to kind of design the protocol. Now, another thing that we also saw is that. The, the group that was given the force field and the visual, they were able to learn better and retain better. Okay, the group that was given only the visual group, uh, visual force field, they were able to learn well in the beginning, but but had but very soon sort of forgot about it. Right, and and uh, those are all kind of important points because uh, uh, a typical therapy that you do, a lot of that is based on visual feedback. Right? So if you go to a clinic, I mean, many times you have a mirrors in front of you or, or doing things, right? And, and those are sort of uh, kind of standard protocol when, when people do these uh, 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 Any questions? Okay. And, and of course, I mean, our goal was uh, not only to kind of look at uh, the subjects, but to see how we can extend this to stroke patients, right? And, and a typical stroke patient just to have a cartoon here, if this is the healthy trajectory of, of the foot, a stroke patient's trajectory would look something like this. They're much smaller, right? They're not able to sort of bend their knees as much. They're not able to sort of swing their le le kind of legs as far. And the question is, how do you sort of grow that trajectory, right? Eventually, it's come up with the with age match healthy, healthy subject data, right? And, and of course, I mean, coming back to your point, you don't do it in a single session. You do across multiple sessions. And these are actually 15 training sessions, right? Each of these sessions is about 45 minutes or so. We look at over a six week period on a one week of training, other one of no training, again training, no training, and so forth. And then you look at what is the retention sort of after sort of uh, several weeks after the, everything is done. Yeah? And, uh, um, and I'm going to show you some videos of, of uh, these subjects. And these are again very, very old uh, data sets. Um, so these are all sort of things that were done about 2008 or so. This is, uh, in, in all of these videos, the robot is not applying any force speed or anything like that. That's force will only do in the training period, right? And these are patients who actually did 15 sessions. This is their gait before training, right? And this is how they were walking sort of after 15 sessions of training, right? And uh, I'm going to kind of put this video one more time here. So, sorry about that. So, so you saw the videos and uh, um, and, and these are the data in, uh, if I look at it from a quantitative point of view. This is the first subject, this is the second subject and uh, uh, this is the, uh, uh, um, so in this case uh, if I were to take an age and size match and the subjects and have them walk at the same speed as uh, the stroke patient the walking, this is what the trajectory would look like, right? And the stroke patients before the training, that is his green gate, after five days of training, they get the blue gate. After 10 sessions of training, they have uh, the red gate. And after 15 sessions of training, they have the, the pink gate. Right? And you can see here that uh, the training is able to improve their gate from this green template all the way to the pink template. And this is the reference that we provided uh, to them from age math subjects. I found in all the cases of the, the of the sick patients, that the, the trajectory has a self intersection. Is that is that common? Um, so, uh, it all depends on every patient is so different from each other, and some of them do, and some of them don't. Yeah, but it's it is very common. It's very common. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and so this is something that we are kind of published about 2009 or so. Uh, just to kind of show that these are feasible things to do with stroke patients with these kinds of exoskeletons. Um, 
and, and of course, uh, uh, following that, we had these uh, fairly large studies, and these are, uh, 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 in this case, we had nine stroke patients who went through these kind of training protocols based on whatever we had learned from our previous study, and then we had a six month follow up after the training was complete. Because many times you just don't do any intervention, but you look at what is the effect of the intervention sort of down the road and how much they were able to sort of uh, use that uh, uh, in, in terms of. So this is just a patient here. He's walking sort of before and after training and you can sort of see his uh, speed of walking, the confidence, the way he's kind of walking, the step length and so forth. And, and you can see a tremendous uh, difference here. But, but this data is sort of even more interesting here. This is from the group data, not from a single subject, from, but from these nine subjects who were there in our study. Before the training, this is the self-selected speed of walking, not in a treadmill, but in their home, we just uh, on overground walking. Right? And you can see here that the speed of walking is about this blue, the yellow one. After six weeks of training, this is the, temp this is the speed of, of, of their walking. But what is very interesting here, six months down the road, when they came back, their speeds were even better than, than what, what, you, what you see out here. Okay? And this is not unusual because uh, many times, when you provide confidence to the people, right, and increase their walking speed, right, they may be able to sort of cross the lights sort or of go across the road, which they would otherwise not have confidence to do that. They sort of go to the park, they're going to do things, and as a result of it, uh, once you initiate these changes in the brain, they sort of keep, 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 uh, keep uh, going, going on. Um, and, uh, and of course, I mean, that uh, uh, was a, a, a major, uh, um, kind of, this was a major project from the National Institute of Health that funded us for almost 10 years or so to look at these exoskeletons and how you can sort of improve the rate of these natural patients. So we learned a lot from this uh, study, but of course uh, the question was, uh, what next? Where should this uh, go? And that sort of motivated us, I mean, that, so we identified several kind of important questions here. These exoskeletons that you saw, saw out here, they are fairly heavy and bulky. Right? So for example, the, the machine out here could easily be about 20 kilograms. Right? So what you're strapping on the human body is a fairly substantial weight. Right? It's kind of think of, let's say, uh, 10 to 15 kilograms uh, on somebody who is about 60 to 70 kilograms. Right? So you're adding a lot of inertia in, into, in, into, into the system. Now the second thing is that uh, um, these uh, patients, the, the, the exoskeleton sort of does well during the swing phase of the gait. Right? So it kind of helps you in terms of swinging the leg. But doesn't do anything while you're doing, while in stance. Right? So stance basically means that when your foot is on the ground. Right? And at that time, this exoskeleton is not doing very much. But if you look at the gait cycle of people, it turns out to be that 64% of our gait cycle is during stance. And only 34, 36% is the swing. Right? So yes, we are doing something in the swing, but we, but it doesn't sort of, it's not really effective from the stance phase of the gate. So we try to address these issues. Uh, the first uh, 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 design that we had, we call it a cable-driven active leg exoskeleton. Right? So now we got rid of all rigid links in, in our machine. And in this case, what you have here, it's a, it's a wire-driven system. Right? And what you, well, in this case, you have three cuffs, one at the pelvis, other one is the thigh, and the third one is the shank. Right? And these are all 3D printed cuffs with uh, ABS plastics and so on. Right? And uh, uh, the way you actuate it is basically using sort of wires. And you wrap these wires, kind of, you use the wires uh, carefully within, within the links. So, may, so in our mechanism literature, we see, see a lot of uh, cable driven parallel robots. Right? So these are single rigid bodies which are kind of connected by cables. But in this case, if you think of your human leg, it's a multi-degree of freedom, multi-limb system, right? And what you're really doing is you're using these cables and you're applying tension in the cables at appropriate time to the gait cycle so that you can create these force fields that you were doing otherwise in, in our, uh, with, with our really new exoskeleton. So here is a, a, a device. Um, I mean, we, we tested this on uh, healthy subjects to show that uh, you can actually retrain eight of these uh, patients or uh, these individuals. Um, and I think I also uh, put that art down as one of the reading material uh, if you wanted to know more about the, the design and the control of uh, this cable driven exoskeleton. Now, the important thing to point out here is that the weight of this exoskeleton is one tenth of the weight of the rigid link exoskeleton. So it's about two to three kilograms. 
and you can further sort of uh, shave it off by, by appropriate design. Another important thing about uh, the difference here is that a rigidly exoskeleton, right, there's a physical joint between the thigh and, and, the, and the shank, right, and that axis has to be really uh, 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 be aligned with the human axis, right. The machine axis, of course, is fixed, right, you can't change it, but the human axis sort of keeps on moving, right, because as you are moving, these are bones that are sort of kind of moving on, on top of each other, right, so that joint is never fixed, right, so the alignment of these rigid link exoskeleton is almost impossible, right? While in this uh, design here, there is no, no rigid link here, right? So there is no notion of a joint alignment in this case because it's all just wires that are connecting between two segments. So these are two major uh, uh, differences between this cable device versus, versus the uh, rigid link device. And in fact, we uh, just did a study with stroke patients here. So this is a um, uh, a study that we had uh, uh, 11 stroke patients, we wanted to kind of look at the feasibility of, of, the, of using this device for, to train the gait. So here is a stroke patient, I'm going to show you a video of this. So this is the C. Alex with active assistance. In this case, the goal here is to increase our kind of uh, uh, step length and step height because these are the two common sort of uh, uh, um, uh, issues that most stroke patients face with. They are, they are not able to sort of walk fast enough and also they are not able to clear the foot off the ground and, and so they may stumble upon that upon kind of fall down. And, uh, um, and we have completed this study, we haven't actually published the study here, but uh, basically we are able to show that through this intervention you are able to uh, kind of create a larger step length just like we did for the rigid exoskeleton and, uh, um, and uh, um, also looking at portable versions of this because this uh, cable driven device doesn't have to be uh, uh, done on a treadmill, it can be actually moved over ground, that is one of our active projects is how to sort of transition this device from our laboratory uh, to, to the uh, uh, over ground walking. So um, I'm going to sort of uh, uh, stop here, maybe take any questions that you may have. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so I was just interested in, are you kind of sensing any sort of muscle activity from the humans or is it just uh, your position sensing kind of thing. So, so in this case, what we we have is uh, so this is integrated with uh, uh, IMUs, and so that tells you the kinematics of it. Uh, when we do stroke patients, we try to avoid putting a lot of sensors on them uh, because stroke patients get tired very quickly, and and if you were to put any kind of EMDs on their muscle groups, it takes about 20 minutes or so, 20 plus minutes, and and so which means that the actual the study time that we that we get is is smaller. So. For, for our active training, we don't actually put any EMGs, but for evaluation, then we would actually put them and see how, how you, how, what kind of person changes are there. Uh, you, you can see in the video that the, feet, the foot, the right foot of the patient is oriented not in the direction of the movement, but is oriented sideways. Yeah. So there was some attempt to modify this. Okay. That that that, that that's, a, that's a good point. So what uh, uh, Rico is saying here that look at his foot, and her and her foot is actually kind of going a little bit different direction. So our exoskeleton is only for the hip and the knee joint. It doesn't sort of go all the way to the ankle. At least this version of it. Um, and uh, uh, so we are not really not doing anything at, at the end of the day. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. I think there's one more question. Uh, is it like same for everyone or it depends upon the, uh, the height and weight? Yeah, so what we do is we uh, we normalize. So so we so we have data from almost 200 people or so over time. And we sort of normalize that with their height, their age, sex, and so forth. So, so there is, so we have a data bank and where we make the best trajectory that will fit a, a, a person who is in our training. So you predict the trajectory for a uh, and no, we don't predict, but we actually take data from them. So we, we would actually put a lot of healthy subjects on our devices, and we have data that we kind of collected over years, and then we use that data bank as a way to uh, kind of uh, create trajectories for first two patients. Yeah, so we don't use a biomechanical model or anything like that to sort of uh, create, because, because nobody knows what the biomechanical model will do. Yeah. There's all these issues about the angles to the center of the plane. Is there anything like about the foot angle? 
I, that, that, that's a good point. So in all of the the uh, 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 the, the, the outcome measures, I'm sh showing you sagittal data, but the but the device itself, uh, it's not a sagittal device because when you put the cables on, you can actually create forces in all all directions. So even though that is all happening, but what I'm showing you here is only data from the sagittal. Data. All right. So let's kind of move move ahead. Uh, so one of the things that I, I said to you here is that uh, all these exoskeletons are good for the swing phase of the gate, right? So what happens during the stance phase, right? And, and just to do, describe stance here, when you walk, when you put your, when you, when, as you take your step, you first have a heel strike, right? And then you put your weight on the leg, right? And then you do a twelve, right? So if you think of, let's say, a typical gate cycle, about 64% of the gate cycle is when one of the two legs is doing stance, right? And, and, and we wanted to sort of see how we can sort of address this. And what we did is uh, we, we created this uh, uh, cable-driven device, and this kind of looks more like a CDPR, right? Cable-driven uh, sort of uh, uh, robots. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of this is motivated from some of the earlier work that we had done in 1990s or so, where we're looking at uh, 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 six or seven arcs or seven cable driven kind of uh, um, um, objects so so we had a kind of a large project from NSF kind of uh, looking into that so we, we understood some of that and that's what we kind of uh, um, uh, uh, tried out here so what you see here is in this case we have a pelvic belt right and on the pelvic belt you have hooks for up to seven wires right and and essentially you can uh, um, uh, create any kind of architecture that you want with the, with the cable system, right? So here we have, let's say, put all these cables kind of in a downward fashion, right? So I can sort of load the person downward. <coughs> in this case here, the cables are put in a in a sort of a, a cross section with the pelvis, right? So now I can sort of pull you in a different direction if you wanted to. Um, here I have sort of some forces down, some up, right? So sometimes uh, people do a gravity weight support while, while training. So we can mimic, mimic some of that here. Or this is kind of a more general configuration here where you have uh, kind of, uh, we can provide any kind of force and moment because with seven cables, you can create any kind of pelvic force and moment, okay, on, on, on the system. Now what is very interesting out here is that we have a real time way of knowing where the cables are. Right? And we solve in real time a certain, so cable tension that will deliver a certain force and a moment profile on your pelvis. Right? So while you're walking, at every single time as you're walking, there's a camera system that captures it. And from that, we solve in real time a cable tension decomposition that will allow you to sort of generate a force on the pelvis. Right? And then we'll kind of play around with this uh, force to see what, how people kind of react to these, uh, these forces. Okay? Um, also, you can kind of create these forces kind of based on your gate uh, uh, gate uh, uh, events. So, gate event would be like a heel strike, or a mid support, or a toe off, or or swing phase. So, you can you can know all of that. So, so that way you have a full idea of what phase of the gate you are at, and and how you want to sort of create these interventions. Right. So, coming back to my first slide, I can ask what if questions. Right? And then see how people sort of respond to some of that. And I'm going to show you a bunch of these uh, here with you. Um, some of the motivation for this also sort of came out from this kind of picture here. Right? So when children are learning to walk, right, what would the mother typically or parents would do? Right? They would sort of support the child at the pelvis. Right? Because the pelvis is sort of really the, you know, the center of mass is very close to the pelvis. Kind of center of the pelvis. Right? So what we're really doing is we are, we are creating <coughs> forces on the pelvis with this particular device and seeing how people will sort of uh, change their, their gait, balance, and so on. Okay. So, um, so this is the first experiment that we had done here, just kind of get, uh, get a sense here. And the motivation for this is simple. If I was sort of walking with a suitcase in my right hand, right? right? And, and, and you walk for some time with a suitcase, and then later on, you put the suitcase down on the floor. Okay, the question is, would you walk a little bit differently, right? And and uh, what we're really doing here is, if you think of this green 
uh, line, okay, that is mimicking a force that you're applying, right? And as the as as you're swinging your your red leg, right, it's kind of following your your thigh region and kind of providing a force. Right? right? So you can now sort of choose an amount of force that you want to 10%, 20% body weight, okay, and, and see see what what happens, right? And uh, uh, and the motivation really for here is that many of the stroke patients walk asymmetrically. Right? Of course, I mean our goal is not to make healthy subjects walk asymmetrically, but to kind of understand the basic science and see if we can flip it around. And, and uh, when patients with stroke are walking asymmetrically, how can we help them to walk symmetrically? Right? So this is the first experiment that we did, um, and uh, um, and uh, and we of course uh, found some very interesting results. And those results basically say. So here is kind of the uh, the protocol. We have walked them about 16 minutes with this kind of unbalanced uh, or asymmetric force, and then we looked at how they adapted to this external force. Okay, after for about 10 minutes or so, and and to, to see. And what we really found is that uh, early on they were walking symmetrically. This was kind of like zero. Zero is, is right minus. So if I take any parameter that is between the left and the right leg. Okay, R minus L would be zero because you are walking symmetrically, so it should be close to zero, right? But what we found is that after this training, I mean that that sort of symmetry sort of went went off uh, uh, because of the experience that you had with this uh, with this loading. Um, and and I think also I put this particular uh, reading material in your uh, um, um, list of things here. So if you are interested in more about it, you you are welcome to do that. Um, so this is, uh, then we kind of uh, did an intervention with stroke patients, right? And uh, here is just kind of a video of one of the stroke patients. If you see, this is the walking at the baseline. Okay. And you see that this patient actually is, uh, uh, as a, um, um, this is his weak side, right? And you can see here, he doesn't kind of, kind of he's uh, walking unbalanced. And during the training, what we are, in this case, what we really did is we, um, looked at his uh, uh, gait cycle, and when he was uh, uh, right now, if you see that all of his balance is on his left leg, right, because that is his good leg, and so he feels confident walking on the good leg, but doesn't want to sort of uh, put as, as an emphasis on, on, on the on the right leg. So what we did is that as soon as he was about to kind of hit the hit the right foot, we pushed his center mark center of mass on the right side, right. So we forced him to bear more weight on on the weak side. Right? And, uh, and in fact, you can see here that after training, which is without any any force, he's actually walking more on the on the, on the, on the, on the right side. Right? And if I look, but to and so this is a study that we had 11 patients with stroke. Okay, where all of them sort of very, very intervention, and this is a number which is kind of is a symmetry ratio between the good side and the weak side. Okay, and and of course, I mean these were uh, patients who underwent five training sessions over a week or so. So there was a, a mild increase in the symmetry, of course, not, not a huge change, but uh, at least it kind of showed the feasibility of the idea, even though this five session was not uh, good enough for, for, for this group to kind of benefit from this. Any questions? Yeah, but in, in, all, in all your cases, the question is holding the rail. It doesn't affect the measurements? Um, so so that, that's, that's, that's a great point. Yeah. So, uh, we try to encourage them as much as possible not to hold the rail, but but many times I mean they just 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 didn't have the, the comfort level and, and some of that. So this particular patient actually is using uh, the handrail, but not everybody. But we encourage them as much as possible. That, that yeah. would change the measurements. Uh, of course, of course, yeah. So 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 in fact, uh, I mean that is an alternate force path that 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 he's taking, and that is not great from from the point of view. Now, um, now, as I said there earlier, that like now we can ask uh, a number of interesting questions. So, um, a lot of children have got cerebral palsy. In fact, uh, this data is got three out of 1,000 children have cerebral palsy, and this is at the time of birth, and and uh, they have a lifelong sort of disease after that. And many of these children actually walk with a crouch gait after cerebral palsy. And look at this video, and I'm going to uh, walk this, uh, show the video one more time here. Um, and here is a is a walking of this person. He's walking over ground, and as you see, he's kind of walking with a crouch. Crouch basically means that he's kind of flexing his knee and kind of walking like this. 
right? And, and many of these children actually walk uh, uh, like that, not all, but some of them. And, and the question was, what can we do to make them walk more straight? Right? And typical physiotherapy that people do is they take these patients and provide them a gravity suspension, gravity low. Right? So I, I take a 20% of your body weight by this cable. And so now when they're walking on a treadmill, they have to walk with less weight. So on the treadmill, they walk very well. Okay, but when they put them on the ground, they're kind of walking in the same way. Right? So, yeah, so it doesn't work. So what we thought is, why not do the opposite of that? Right? So what we did is, we actually had them walk with a downward force by 10%. Right? And why? Because when you walk, your pelvis sort of goes up and down like this. Right? And so in the face that you are moving your pelvis up, you are actually taking a 10% extra body weight and you are, you are moving that up. Right? So which means that all of your extensive muscles have to work a little bit more to sort of get you, get you up. Right? And, uh, uh, and that's the intervention we did. We actually had these uh, 15 training sessions over a six week period and then we followed them up to a month later on and uh, this is how, how the child <laughs> sort of walks before and after. This is the, the video that you saw earlier. This is how the child kind of walks up there. Right? And of course, I mean, he doesn't walk completely straight like, like you and I, I would do, but he's walking a lot more straighter than, than, than what, what, what you saw. In fact, this is just a representative video, and many of the children actually walking, walking the same way. Now, if I look at the, the child on the treadmill, okay, you, can, you can see his, uh, this is before training. Okay, this is uh, after three sort of sessions of training, and of course it's going to walk a lot faster and so forth. And that of course is contributing to it. But what is also very important here is, is the force. So our treadmills can actually uh, record the forces that the foot applies when walking. Okay, and typically when, when you and I walk, when we put our heel down, we have a peak of force, right? We generate a force. And when we have a toe off, we generate a force. So typically this is, the, this is how, how our force profile looks like. But these children, before before training, this is how their peak looked like. Right? So they didn't have really the right peak. Right? The timing of their peaks were off, right? and they were not generating the right, the right peaks. And by the end of training, this is what, what they were doing. Right? And so they were generating the forces through their feet on, on the treadmill in the right timing, and that sort of also helped out in, in terms of that. Yeah. Um, so also I've kind of put that reading material in, in your list if you want to sort of read it. Now as I said, we can use this keypad, uh, 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 we call it, in lots of different ways. This is another way that we kind of used it. And what we're really doing is we are providing controlled perturbations on, on these individuals. Right? So what is perturbation, right? Those of you who are in New York City, right? You, you're on the train, the train sort of, oh, you have to kind of catch yourself, right? And our hypothesis is that you can train the neuromuscular system by giving, the, giving them repeated sort of experience in others, right? So for example, here, as the person is walking, we are actually pulling them back, kind of forward and backwards, kind of going kind of forward and backward. In this case, we're kind of doing the lateral perturbations, right? So, and, and you can control the, the amount of perturbation, the direction of the perturbation, Right? And you can sort of uh, really give it any, any part of the gait cycle that you want to. So we have a very, very good control of what we are doing and then we can sense and then later on sort of interpret the data to see how people are sort of reacting to these situations. This is a healthy subject. This is a healthy subject, yeah. yeah. We always start out with healthy subjects, right? Because we are scared to put any, any kind of older person. But we'll show you how, how this, uh, the same idea was kind of used for other so now we kind of move from healthy subjects to older people, 70 years, right? And in fact, uh, some of the participants were 94 years old, right? And, and the kind of perturbation that we actually gave them were between 10% to, to 25%. So fairly large perturbations, right? And so they were all kind of successful in them. And what you have here are two groups called the experimental group, which were given the force perturbations, and the control group who just walked on the, on the treadmill but were not given any force. Right? And uh, what we have here on the, on the y-axis, a measure called margin of stability. Right? The best way to understand here is if you look at the center of mass and your base of support, right, further away you are from the boundary of the base of support, right, the more stable you are. Right? And uh, what you see here, that the 
At the baseline, both the control group and the experimental group, they had the same marginal stability because they're all sort of old, healthy people. Like they're just old, but they're all still healthy people. Now, the, the group that was given a perturbation, you can see that they are able to improve their margin of stability a lot more, and this is statistically significant with respect to the control group. Right? That's the media of training. And, and then if you were to sort of take data later on, after about 10 minutes or so, they're still able to kind of maintain some of this team. Right? And, and of course, I mean, this is just a, a verification of the idea that in fact, you can improve the balance in older people with this kind of technology. Yeah. Um, and uh, here is a study that we did with a group of Parkinson patients. Again, I'm, I'm just kind of walking you through here, but I think also I put this on your reading material if you want to. Okay, I have two groups here. One is the Parkinson group, other one is the healthy control group. They are roughly the same age. Yeah, and uh, uh, what happens is that in Parkinson patients, they use a medicine called levodopa, which actually good for tremor, but doesn't sort of help in balance. Right? So many of the Parkinson patients, uh, they have no way of improving their balance. And and uh, what we were able to show here is that the uh, first of all, there are two charts here. Uh, this is the healthy control, this is the Parkinson, and if you see that the margin of stability of the healthy control is higher than the Parkinson group, which is sort of expected. Okay. But this is what happens to the healthy control group and the Parkinson group. Both groups are able to improve the balance in, in the same way uh, as, as the healthy control. And, and, and there was a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, interesting news uh, media that uh, this could be a way by which you can sort of improve uh, balance uh, in, kind of in, in patient patients. So, um, all right. So, I'm going to take you a little bit further here. So far, we were talking about walking and balance. Okay. But now I'm going to sort of move a little bit about postural balance. Right. So, think of this way: you are kind of sitting on a on a chair, right, and you can of course kind of reach around you, right? But there are many, many children with cerebral palsy or somebody with spinal cord injury, they have little, kind of no control on their upper body, right? And the question is, is there a way for us to improve that upper body control through this kind of a robotic intervention? And what we really did here is not very much. We just kind of slit this, this belt from the pelvis to the trunk region, right? And it's, in this case, they are sitting down here. And, and this is a step, and, and what uh, this uh, cable does is creates a little force field, right? Just like those tunnel ideas that I talked about in the robotic exoskeleton. And so if I'm sort of uh, trying to reach here, very soon I can sort of go further because I'll have root stability. Yeah? And, and now what this machine really does is when you come to the boundaries here, it creates a soft force field around you. Right? So think of this way, there's a virtual person who's kind of, kind of, kind of helping you so if you go went too far away, it sort of brings you back safely in, in, into the region. Right? And this is a study that we published uh, in uh, RAL uh, several years ago. And, and the study was basically to show that if you're, if you're sitting and you were trained with this kind of apparatus, you can actually reach by almost 70% uh, more with, with, with this, this kind of, just a single kind of uh, training for about 45 minutes or so. And, and that was uh, uh, very interesting and we kind of built upon that to train uh, kids with cerebral palsy and I'm going to show you a video here, I think that could be most interesting for you here. Okay, so this is a child, okay, she has got cerebral palsy and you look at her upper body posture. Right? She has got a very little control of, it, of her upper body. And what we did is we actually, uh, this is a physical therapist who's kind of working with us here, she's kind of wearing this uh, cable device. And depending on where you have a loss of your postural stability, we kind of come in and kind of apply this, this force field on, on, onto you. And these are training sessions over almost six weeks or so, very intensive training. And you want to sort of look at pre-training and the post-training videos of this person. Right? And you can see here in this uh, down video here, the person is able to sort of go far, sort of come back here. Right? They can move in different directions and they're able to kind of rebalance themselves okay, through this training intervention. And this training intervention is all about sort of creating this environment where they can exercise more and, and help in terms of coordination of the muscles 
as well as kind of improve the confidence of being able to sort of uh, uh, build the activities. Um, I'm going to show you another video here with uh, our spinal cord injured patient. Um, and uh, uh, and he has so, so he has very little control of his ability to sort of move forward. Okay, he, he just, just doesn't have that ability. But now with the active device or with the active support here, we are able to show that we can increase his, uh, uh, if I, if I, this, this is, is a plot kind of in the, the sideways and forward backward. If, if I put a, a marker at the center of the trunk, this is how he would be able to sort of move around in different directions before he can kind of resist to it without the help of the, of the machine. And in this case, with the help of the machine, the person is able to almost 400 times you know, increase the area. But of course, it's not, he's not being, uh, uh, he, it's, I mean, he still has to be trained in order to use all that area. But what it tells us that there is a possibility for us to be able to do exercises and training with him to, to be able to sort of use, access as much of this particular space. Um, I will sort of take you to one more further here. This is a device that we have in our laboratory. We call a stand trainer, and uh, uh, and and what it really does is kind of takes this idea of this cable belt a step further, where we have two belts, one at the pelvis, other at the trunk. Okay, and then we have a third belt here, which actually at the knees, and part of it is sort of motivated for patients with complete spinal cord injury. Right, and I want to sort of first kind of have you look over here. This is a, a video, or not a video, a picture of a patient with a complete spinal cord injury. Right, so somebody with a complete spinal cord injury kind of they kind of fall down, right, because they have just no control on any part of the body. So they can collapse at the knees, they can collapse at the trunk, they can collapse at the at the, uh, the pelvis. Right, and uh, so typically the way you help them to train standing is they're kind of holding a, a handlebar. Okay, and there are four therapists around them, right? And they would basically be kind of uh, a focus on each one of their joints, sort of keep them, keep them afloat, right? And the question was, can we sort of get away from there and we can create a robotic device that sort of actually helps them in terms of stand training? Yeah, and uh, uh, we just published the first results of uh, uh, the stand trainer uh, in uh, TNSRE. I may have actually uh, provided a, 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 a copy of the paper as well, which is just about to come out in the, in the TNSRE. But uh, what is uh, interesting here is we actually uh, put two spinal cord injured patients in our device. And I'm going to just kind of show you some of this here. So this is a patient who's a complete spinal cord injury. He has a cervical kind of injury at C3 level. So it's kind of his complete tetraplegic. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, so we have two of these stand trainers, one at Columbia University, other one at the University of Louisville, because they are one of our partners in this particular program. And uh, we are just kind of setting up this, uh, uh, kind of putting sensors on this uh, particular patient. Um, and, uh, um, and then we were to, uh, um, so we were able to uh, um, kind of think first, he, he lied down on this uh, um, bed. Then we, we put him on a wheelchair and brought him out. We were able to stand him in this particular device. Right? And the, the goal here is that instead of these, these physical therapists kind of doing the intervention, we'd like to see if we can sort of uh, uh, see the effectiveness of the stand trainer to do the same kind of intervention. Um, so I'm going to show you a video here. These are just uh, very recent videos here about last uh, week or so, last one or two, three weeks ago. Here is the patient who is actually in the stand trainer. He's standing on a force plate. Here are all the physical therapists around him. Right? And, and of course, uh, what these people are really doing is kind of supporting him while he's kind of uh, falling down. Um, and, uh, um, and here is the, uh, the patient in the stand trainer. Right, and he has a two ring force field here. So we basically, um, I have got a, a kind of radius one and radius two, and then we have a graded amount of force that the machine provides on on, on, on them. And in this case, uh, uh, um, the, the I mean, this is the first time we were kind of looking at the feasibility of this idea, um, and uh, we were able to show that uh, uh, we, 
it's called feasibility was kind of established, and and the goal here is to sort of go for a long term kind of training of of, uh, of, of these patients. Yeah, so we're going to do some of these studies up at Columbia University and some of them at the University. Um, so let me take a pause here and see if you have any questions that you want to ask. I, there was a uh, a lot of material that I talked about. These are all in the context of these cable-driven system, kind of uh, starting out from the CDPRs that you see so commonly in many of the mechanism literature, right? Uh, but this kind of uh, translated into the human body, allows us to kind of make very lightweight devices. I mean, the belt only weighs 300 grams, right? So really, you're not putting any inertia on the human body. And what you're seeing here are the intrinsic sort of uh, reactions of, 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 of these patients. Um, we we use this, so now with this our cable driven T-pad device, we're able to do lots of different things, right? I showed you something that for stroke patients, we're looking at asymmetry of the gait, children with cerebral palsy, we're looking at some of these uh, downward pull, or uh, um, or, you, or look at some of the perturbation kind, kind of work uh, for elderly people, <coughs> Parkinson's disease patients, and, and the motivation for this with stand trainer, where we have these two devices at the pelvis and the, and the trunk, which would be kind of used in the next several years uh, for us to get patients with the uh, real companies. Yeah. So the force field or agnostic to who the patient is, it is more like uh, based on deflection? So, so the force field is all just, so in real time, you are monitoring the position, okay. right? And that is, that is, that information is basically fed back to the force field. So it's a position-based force field, but you can program the force field any way you want to. And what, in fact, what we found is that patients with spinal cord injury require a different kind of force field compared to a patient with cerebral palsy, right? Because because a patient with, cerebral, with spinal cord injury, they have a good ability for a, for a certain amount, and then after suddenly they cannot kind of do it. So if you're not able to kind of generate a fast, very quick, and, and a large amount of force field, it won't won't work out. So again, I mean, these things that you learn through trial and error and try to sort of see how we can incorporate that. Yes? We thought we could extend into like this and um, supports and force fields for like say Marcus and Trevor like that. Um, so, so again, I, I didn't talk about here, but there is a, a device, we call it Kerex, which is a cable driven arm exoskeleton. So if you look at the literature, I mean, there are some, some but, but that we designed for, for uh, stroke patients as well. I mean, I think it's a very highly cited paper, I think, if you, if you look at you, you, you'll find, find it's a transactional robotics paper. But we haven't done it for Parkinson's patients, because Parkinson's patients are kind of hard. Yeah, we, we, we looked at some tremor ideas, but uh, they're hard. Maybe, maybe some of your technology would be better than that. Yeah? Uh, you showed a lot of plots where you validated that the, the individuals are changing their game. Uh, so is there a way are there unintended consequences in the way people are trained <coughs> negatively in some fashion, even though that the outcome is, is, is uh, that the, the gate outcome is, is Yeah, I, I think I think these are these are great questions because nobody knows. Right. So you focus on a such a certain outcome measure. In this case maybe uh, speed of walking or symmetry of the gate or something like that, right? But your point is are there some unintended consequences that are happening? because of training. And those may be long-term things that you would know and, and would not come out in the short term. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's a valid point, but, but we don't have answers to these. And many times, I mean, when you make a conclusion about these medical conditions, you have to do these very elaborate experiments before you can make those conclusions. Right, so as engineers, we're kind of used to think, oh, you change things on the fly, right? You do this, kind of change the algorithm and this and that, right? But if you have to, if you are going to check a new algorithm, right, it takes a, a while to be able to sort of, uh, I mean, it's, you have to repeat it entirely, entirely the whole, whole thing in order to sort of make any kind of valid conclusion. Yes. So, I know that you said that you initially used the uh, rigid body mechanisms to change the gait, and then you switched over to the cable. You know, when I think about the, the gait, uh, I, I would think that Maybe wrong about this. It's a function of not only anthropomorphic data, as you mentioned, but also, uh, you know, what kind of joint torque you can apply, what the muscle forces can be, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
I remember that your on the first few slides, your first bullet point was force-driven motion training. So it's it's like you are the chain the force and you're retraining it for the motion. When you switched over to the cable-driven robot, did you find that how you that you were able to able to uh, match the the stress profile on the for the muscles as well as the joint torque profiles is better because you had a little bit of compliance now that you didn't have before. So, so, um, so I, th I think they're all all good points. So, our cables are still considered to be rigid cables, and. Uh, um, um, but you can change the direction of the force now because the cables can move, unlike so like even, actuator. Yeah. So even with the cables, we actually do a tension control. We never do a position control. Okay. So that is a philosophy we have sort of always been away from all our competitors, right? So many of the strategies that did not work out in rehabilitation because people were doing motion-based strategy, right? So they were basically doing a position control, and and. Um, <coughs> And a lot of that is sort of attributed to the failure of the locomotive machines because they were all sort of position control machines. So back in 2007 when we started out, we always sort of had in our mind that we would always do force control and never position control. So even though we have a position based force controls, but our all our control is actually a force delivered and we make sure that our, uh, I mean our force controllers are valid controllers and we will deliver what, what we are. But but uh, but yes, I mean between the cable system versus the rigid link system, uh, our cable systems, um, a part of our goal is to sort of make it portable, right? Portable means that uh, you are trying to do more with smaller motors because you want to sort of create lightweight and things like that. So there is a, a trade-off because of that how much tension you can sort of apply with 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 the cables, and of course that is a function of the motors that you're using among other. Okay, all right, so if there are no questions, I'm going to go, go forward to uh, another segment of our work, which is look at uh, spine braces. Right? So spine braces, uh, again, those of you who know, uh, uh, a lot of young teenagers would have uh, an abnormal curvature of the spine. And uh, these are conditions that are called scoliosis. And if, if they are left untreated, right, the, the, the curve, I mean, normally if you look at, look at me from the back, Okay, I've got a straight curve, right? But people with scoliosis, they have kind of a sideways bent. And if the if the curve progresses more than a certain uh, range, then they have to basically go in and fuse the spine segments, right? So you basically go into and put a rod between these uh, different vertebral segments, and then that way you take away those degrees of freedom between your vertebral segment. Now, if you think about the the technology in scoliotic braces hasn't changed over the years. People are still kind of using the same. Uh, sort of uh, uh, braces, and you tighten the braces and hope that the patient, the patient will have, have, a, have a rigid uh, um, kind of vertical posture. So our philosophy was, could we sort of create these braces which are force control as opposed to just, uh, or, or we, or first of all, we provide active control into it, right? So the way we, we design our braces, if you see, these are really two layers to our platforms. Right? And again, I mean, there is a, not a whole lot of innovativeness in terms of the, the Stuart platform itself, but these are six degree of freedom sort of uh, uh, kind of uh, Stuart platform, but they are designed around the human body. Right? And there are two layers of it. The, the, the lowermost sits on the pelvis, the second one goes at the mid trunk, and the third one sort of goes just underneath your, your, your arms. And what you can do is you can really control the a segment relative to the adjacent segment either in force mode or position mode. So here we are, we are aligned with the position and the force mode. And, and we have uh, basically, we have actuators that kind of tell us uh, exactly the force being applied and the, the length of the thing, uh, of, of each segment. And you can do forward kinematics to sort of compute what is the brace position and orientation, or which is the same as the, the body position and orientation, and also how much force you're applying. And, and these uh, devices allow us for the first time to look at some of the intrinsic biomechanical behavior of the body. Right? So if I were to put something like this on the human body, and if I were to apply forces onto it, I can sort of measure displacement, right? And sort of gives us information about sort of stiffness, right? We're talking about Professor Hoyle in the morning, stiffness and strength, right? So it sort of gives you information about some of those stiffnesses. And these are six-dimensional stiffnesses, if you think about it, right? And, uh, and basically, we were, uh, 
looking at these different characteristics, you can see if healthy, young, able-bodied people, if their stiffness characteristics are different from people who have got these abnormal curvatures. And, and we had studies where uh, uh, these are, uh, so this is a patient who has got a kyphosis, kind of, uh, it's a kind of, uh, uh, um, sort of a U on, on, the, on the upper body. And this is a, a sort of scoliosis, this kind of lateral shape of the curve. And what we found is that compared to able-bodied individuals, their biomechanical properties are different. Of course, they have to, have to be different. And, and, and these are sort of first ways of being able to characterize these with these, uh, um, with, with these uh, devices. Um, this is uh, another uh, kind of uh, variation of this. We are looking at people who are in uh, a wheelchair, right? And we interview some of the people who are restricted to the wheelchair and we ask them, what is that you find the hardest? Right? Because many of these people are actually kind of stuck in the wheelchair. Right? And one of the things that I said that we cannot bend down and pet the dog. Right? Just think about it. Right? What are they saying? They are basically saying that in the wheelchair, I cannot sort of bend down right, and be able to do things. Right? Because I would not feel confident of being able to sort of come back. Right? And so what we thought is, <coughs> why not develop these active devices? Okay, in this case, this is again is a variant of our spine brace basically. I've got two rings here. This is the, the, the base ring and this sort of mid thoracic ring here and these are this is a four degree of freedom parallel actuated device and part of the motivation here is that many of these patients with scoliosis um, uh, or, may, or many of the injuries who are in wheelchairs they've developed something called a neuromuscular scoliosis right so often if you notice somebody who's in a wheelchair you'll find that they're, they're, they have a bent body like that right? and it happens because of the way they are sitting in the wheelchair and over prolonged usage of their wheelchair uh, knobs, they, they essentially kind of develop this neuromuscular scoliosis. So what we really did is, in this case, we allowed these patients to be able to bend in the, in the satchel plane and be able to sort of turn around like this, but not allow them to sort of have a lateral translation, because lateral translation is what sort of creates scoliosis or axial rotation. So, we, so these are two degrees of freedom that we took away from, from the device. So while you're in the device, you won't be able to uh, to move, move laterally or be able to sort of uh, have, have a, yeah, have a right? um, there, there are several papers that have just appeared. I think uh, JMR has a, a, a paper or two that came out a couple of years ago. And this is a recent paper that we uh, published in, or is going to appear in Robotica, where we show that with this active support, we have these patients do various kinds of exercises, or movements, and we looked at some of their muscles and, and with this device, with active assistance of the device, you can actually show that they can actually bend on fur further and still able to use less activity on their various spine seg or uh, muscle segments to be able to kind of do these activities. Uh, this is uh, another uh, uh, important uh, application that we thought, and these are patients who have got uh, head drop, right? And that's how to be that. Uh, uh, I mean, it's not a very large group of uh, uh, individuals, but uh, but there are people who are just not able to sort of keep their head up, right? And ALS is definitely one of one of the diseases. Um, but also, there are many uh, people who have got poor coordination of your neck, right? So, especially children with cerebral palsy, they have actually very poor control of their neck. Or if somebody has a whiplash, right? Whiplash is a big thing that happens uh, on, on to many of us, right? in a car accident, and in this case, I mean, you get a sort of sudden jerk on your, on, on your upper body. In the cervical region of the spine sort of gets affected the most. And, and the question is, how can we sort of create a brace, which is an active brace that can help you, kind of enable you to sort of provide assistance and straining as needed for, for these individuals. So, uh, so here is a, a, a brace that we have developed, okay, and this is a, 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 a three degree of freedom sort of uh, active brace is primarily designed for the range of motion of the head neck, right? And, uh, um, and it's uh, really what we did is we took a spherical mechanism and we talked, we, we heard a lot about spherical mechanism in the morning and we, we essentially kind of started that as, as, a, as a starting point, but we took the intersection points of these axes and changed that. So it's basically, it's a, uh, uh, it's a change from the structure of the spherical joint so that way you can get some translation 
okay, but a larger rotation. And, uh, and basically this was matched to the data of uh, healthy subjects as they kind of go through the range of motion and we look at the translation and rotation. So these are all camera data that we acquire from the human body and then we use that in the design of, of this uh, device. And uh, there are several papers that have uh, come out in the last year or two um, in uh, uh, IGP transactions, uh, uh, kind of there are four or five papers that have come out. I think they have, may have put one or two in your, in your reading, reading material. What can you do with these devices? Uh, you can do a lot of things, right? If you right now go to a clinic and ask them to measure your range of motion, how do you think that they, they, they measure it? They take a protractor and put it out there and say, oh, you've got 10 degrees here, 10, 30 degrees here, and so on. But of course, we know that your head movement is kind of really a three-dimensional, right? So there's a need for a measurement device, right? We also have versions of it where you have a so somebody who's got a bent head like this, if you want to sort of uh, provide a spring force, so there's a paper that appeared in the MMT last year or so, uh, which allows you to sort of tune the springs in each one of these legs. And, and essentially you can sort of create a, a sort of a neutral position for, for the individual. But of course in, in our mind that's not as useful. What is really useful is an active device. But in this case we have three motors because these are the three, three degrees of freedom of our head neck brace and you can really control that, do a variety of things. We can create force control, position control, all sorts of control here. Um, and uh, um, we have actually uh, um, yeah, so this is this is one of the papers that appeared in the artificial robotics and automation letters uh, in 2018, <coughs> yes, last year or so, where where you're kind of using a joystick to kind of create uh, various kind of movement, and so it takes the command from your um, from your joystick and sort of reflects that in terms of movement commands to to here. And we're looking at some of the EMGs of various muscles in your body, how 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 they change as a result of uh, this particular device. So I think I've put at least one paper in, in your reading material if you're interested in reading about it. And of course, you have references of the other ones if you, if you need to. So we have been doing a study with ALS patients. And I'm going to show you, this is the first time I'm going to show you the studies here. These are ALS patients who have got a complete head drop. Right? So on the left, this patient is, is a, so this is without the assistance of the race. And, and you can see here, the person is just not able to sort of keep his head straight. And, and, and what he's being uh, given in front of him on a visual screen, um, an avatar, and he's sort of supposed to follow the avatar to make the movement. And, uh, um, and here, there's an active assistant of the brace, and now you can see that the person is actually able to sort of move and coordinate his head. And in fact, uh, this patient, uh, he said that for the last two years or so, he has not been able to sort of uh, uh, kind of use his head neck in this way, and if he can actually have 10 minutes every day uh, to use this sub brace like this, that can kind of improve his uh, 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 Why the avatar is becoming green? Does that indicate something? Oh, so, so, so the avatar has, a, has a, um, is asking you to do a task, and while you're doing the task, it's sort of telling you what you are doing. So it's basically two superimposed things. One is the desired movement and his actual movement. And that way he can use that as a visual cue to sort of uh, make that movement. But of course, I mean, that's uh, not the best way. I'm going to show you a, a, another slide here later on, where we have actually used the, uh, uh, an eye tracker. So what uh, she's wearing here is an eye tracker, okay, because as I said, the ALS patients typically lose all their movement except for the eyeballs. Right? So the idea is that if I can use the track the eye movements and use that as a command to my, my head neck. Right? And that's what she, she is doing out here. She's actually um, you know, moving her, her pupils. This uh, 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 camera is uh, kind of recording what uh, her intentions are and then it's kind of uh, moving the brace as that of it. And this is the functionality we are right now testing with ALS patients to see how they can use this uh, in, in So um, let me um, kind of pause here if you have any question on this, uh, uh, these braces. How am I doing this time?
have 15 more minutes. All right, so I, I have a few more slides, yes. So, how are the safety issues in the project? How do you, how do you deal with the safety? Safety is the system. Safety. Yeah, safety issue. Shift. Safe, safe, safety. 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 Safety issue, safety issue. Oh, oh, oh yes, I mean, of course, I mean, safety is a paramount <coughs> important, right? So anything that we do, we have to actually get approval from our ethics committee, right? So for every one of the studies, we actually get an IRB approval from our university. And of course, they, they kill us on all kinds of safety issues, right? So, um, but, but of course, I mean, uh, we have to be very careful in terms of whatever we are doing. And it's a very close supervision between the clinician and, and our team. So, um, so, so far, touch wood, we haven't had any, any safety, all of these studies that you've so, have seen so far, we haven't had any major safety issues. <laughs> so, and you can one of those reasons be that because you're using force feedback instead of position feedback? That's, that's, that's a great way to think about it, right? Because uh, in a position feedback, right, if you don't go where you, where, where you need to go, I have sort of basically apply more torque on it. But in a force feedback, I will sort of give a cut of force. Right, so that, that is a, a, a great uh, a safety issue that we incorporate in all of our devices. But of course, I mean, we have physical therapy, we have clinicians, we have students, everybody's out there with the patient. Make sure that uh, nothing, nothing like this can happen. But you good. always have medical doctors? Uh, not, not, all, not on all of our experiments. I mean, they are, because we have a lab, laboratory in the Columbia Medical Center itself, at, right at the rehab medicine department. So we have two labs, one in the engineering campus and one in the medical campus. And this, this laboratory has access to all the clinicians right, right over there. But they are not physically there. I mean, they are just around there. So if there is a need, we can sort of quickly come here. All right. So I'm sort of uh, touch upon the next issue, which is sort of balance, fall, sort of cognition, right? Because we know that fall is a big issue for our society. Right? And people fall because of many different issues. It's not just because I'm, my muscles are weak. Right? I may have a poor co cognition. I may have a poor uh, sort of sensory system. Right? Um, or my, my brain is not able to sort of function as good as when I was 30 year old. Right? So all of that is, is sort of an issue. So in, in our lab, we are sort of looking at uh, how do you sort of combine all of these issues of uh, uh, cognitive decline uh, sensory decline and some of the balance and kind of those kind of measures. So we have a number of projects ar around, around that particular theme. So one of our projects is, a, is, a, is instrumented shoes and this is something that we have been working for close to about seven or eight years or so. And the, and the goal here is that uh, we put insoles in your shoes and we put a variety of sensors. Some of these are pressure sensors, some of them are IMUs and from there we want to sort of get good gate data, right? So if you think of Fitbit, it tells you how many steps you have taken, but it doesn't tell you what is the, the detail of the step. Right? What we are interested here is knowing is uh, when do you do heel strike, right? when do you do the toe off, what is the spatial and temporal features of the gate. Right? And often these things are collected by, by camera measurement systems. And of course those are expensive and things like that. And, and the goal is sort of put that all in, 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 a, in a shoe, it becomes portable. Right? So now you can get this information not only for in the lab, but outside in, in the home center and so forth. And in fact, we did a study where we had 150 kind of older people in the metropolitan New York City area, and, and we actually collected their gait data, right? And from there, we could actually sort of come up with their foot trajectory, and also we had this video data to sort of create a, a, a kind of ground truth to see how well we are doing with the device. And what you see here, if I look at the foot trajectory here, I mean, there's almost kind of, uh, kind of no difference between a reference motion capture data versus what we get from, from our shoes. Um, and there is a paper that is published and I, I may not have put it in, in the um, in the too. Now here are some, some interesting things that you can do with the shoes. Again, this is a video I'm going to show you here. This is something that we did in India at uh, uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. This is a patient who's got Parkinson's disease. And many of these patients have got something called a freezing of gait. Right? And if you see here, as she's turning, she's got a lot of kind of hesitation. She just doesn't have the balance, can't lose the balance. And, and we did an intervention where we actually put in some vibratory feedback in, in the shoe, in addition to kind of measuring the, measuring the, the gait. And, and now we can actually do a gait synchronized vibration 
as they are walking, right? So, so, so one of the issues that uh, persons with Parkinson's disease have, they got a lost rhythm in the brain, and we are hoping that this uh, extra vibratory feedback will create a rhythm, and that may help them in terms of their gait. Um, yeah, so well, I, I don't know. Yeah, so you probably saw that uh, at least in this particular patient, she actually did very well. And this was a, a training over a six week, uh, not a six sessions over a week. And and uh, this uh, at least she actually benefited in terms of uh, being able to um, uh, walk better with this intervention. Um, now, as I said, that uh, uh, we are interested in uh, balance, but in lots of different ways. Right. In this case, we are running experiments where we have this VR facility, right? So we are actually using these VR headsets. And in the VR headset, she's actually seeing as if the world is sort of having a kind of earthquake. Right. She's seeing a, a kind of tremor in the visual field. And as a result of it, her walking, even though there's this all make-believe here, right, but she's, her, her walking is sort of uh, getting affected. And, uh, um, and a lot of this motivation comes out from uh, patients who are, have got vestibular disorder, right? Because in our ears, we have the, uh, the, the sensory apparatus, right? And then, so basically when you're walking, you take the sensory apparatus, you know, the visual field, and, and, your sen and, and, and your stretch reflectors, and, and, and you integrate that in, in your movements and so forth. And uh, what we are basically showing here is, through this kind of visual perturbation, we actually see a change in our gait, right? So your balance and your gait is, is directly affected in terms of what kind of uh, uh, losses you have in various kinds of uh, uh, senses. So this is a, a study that just got published in Gain and Posture. Um, this is something else that we are doing here, which is uh, something called a virtual floor maze test. Right? So what people have shown is that uh, uh, a lot of people who have got uh, Alzheimer's and other, 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 they have got a slow, yes, yeah, so, so so their cognitive levels kind of decline because of the disease. And as a result of it, their executive functioning, right, kind of seeing and kind of responding to things is not, not as good. So we are trying to sort of create a test here where we create a virtual floor maze, right, which I have got different conditions. This is without the virtual reality. This is the virtual reality. But the third one is virtual reality where you kind of create these walls. Right? And, and of course, I mean, with uh, this kind of uh, arrangement, you can sort of create different ways, look at uh, difficulties and things like that. Because what people have shown is that the, the real floor maze test is very correlated for early, uh, uh, for people who have early Alzheimer's and so forth. And, and we feel that uh, with having this particular technology, we may be able to sort of test people out of the laboratory in, in the regular environment and things like that. And in fact, right now, we have a, a study that is coming out in India. We're going to recruit 2,000 patients, or 2,000 individuals that are 75 years or older. And we're going to do a variety of these tests, right? Where, where we have shoes, we have a virtual reality, we have these floor maze tests. So look at their balance, cognition, and faults, right? And see how, what is the interrelation between, between these, uh, these things. Um, and and uh, this is sort of funded by the Indian government uh, with uh, collaboration with two IITs. Uh, Buddha Delhi at Kamila. This is a, a study that we just published here. This is a, a called a light touch cane. Right? And what in this case happening is that uh, we are creating these virtual perturbations again to kind of destabilize the person. But what you see here is that uh, there's a cane that sort of walks next to you, it's a companion. Right? And the only thing that company does is provides light touch to you. Right? And, and if you think about it, is, I mean, many older people, when they're walking, they have somebody kind of walking next to them. Not because they can take physical support, but they just kind of this light touch gives them a perception of where the body is in space. Right? And we, we're trying to characterize it, how the, what is the effect of a robotic device that can sort of go next to you and provide the light touch. And in this case, what we're, we're showing is that uh, with the light touch, your, your balance becomes better, your, your walking becomes better. So, so again, I mean, these are a whole kind of variety of these uh, virtual reality tools that could be very effective in, in the medical applications. Um, so I'm just going to sort of end with something fun. Right? This is something that we had uh, looked at um, almost 10 years ago. And these were little babies. Right? So 
and we ask the question, if I have six month old infants, can we teach them to drive a robot? Right? You ask why. And uh, so, and, and, the, and the part of it is that many of these children, they may have diseases of various kinds which will not allow them to be able to be mobile in the environment. So that will affect social, socialization, interaction with the others. And, and the goal was that if these children can learn to move around the environment, even though they may have a physical inability or disability, but they may still be able to sort of benefit from the social participation part of it. And, and, uh, um, and, this, uh, uh, and we had a number of uh, children that we grew, almost 50 children, um, kind of between the ages six months to two years. And this was a large study that we have published uh, at the University of Delaware where we were able to show that uh, these uh, little babies, uh, you can actually, even though they can't crawl or they can't walk, but they will actually be very good in terms of driving the machine around there. And as long as you reinforce them through repetitive training, they, they will be able to do this kind of that. And, and you can sort of use these for uh, uh, a number of skills acquisition here. And this is an interesting study that we had done at that time where uh, we were uh, having these children to navigate around in, a, in an environment. So now if you have these kids, you provide them early mobility, right? And now you want to sort of use that to their advantage in a functional environment. And in this case, what we did is we created an environment with also obstacles and things like that. And, and what we did is we created this joystick here, which is a four-speed that joystick, right? And so if you are driving in the wrong direction, it sort of provides you haptic feedback that you're actually driving in the wrong direction. Right? And slowly over repetitive training, these kids know how to do that. Right? And then uh, uh, later on, if you, um, so this is one of the child children with uh, cerebral palsy who was in our study, but, but there are two control groups here, two groups, one of the control group was training group. The training group was kind of taught with a four speed, but the control group was not. And, uh, um, and obviously in the, in the beginning, they were not able to sort of navigate to the goal, as you can see, and they all got stuck here. But by the end of training, the, uh, the training group actually did very well. They can sort of make these continuous high speed motions. While, while the kids who did not uh, learn with the four speed uh, were not able to do that. Again, I mean, these are all just uh, great examples of this forced, forced interaction between the human body and the machine and how that sort of helps you in terms of learning kind of new, new functional movements. This is a study that we published in 2011. So it's, it's all from the University of Delaware when I was there. But uh, these are the So uh, I'm going to sort of uh, stop here, right? Um, just uh, want to kind of sort of thank. I have an amazing group of uh, students and postdocs who work with me, and we have a lot of clinician collaborators uh, in neurology, in uh, orthopedic medicine, in, in geriatrics, uh, uh, rehab medicine, and we work together on a daily basis or so. Uh, this is just kind of a video of a little mouse here. We also try to look at animal models of our uh, injuries. So we have a collaboration where the researchers with spinal cord injury sort of create these conditions in, in the mice brain, uh, which sort of mimics a certain kind of injury, and then look at uh, how you can sort of use robotics as a way to kind of make that as a model for uh, uh, retraining human well, beings. Thank you. And, uh, Right, I guess you have given them an opportunity to ask questions on a regular interval, so, but we can still take it, any questions that the audience has. You don't show this video to Peter. <laughs> Do what? You don't show that video to Peter, the ethical treatment of animals. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, they actually get uh, a lot of uh, processions sort of in front of their labs. There's nobody from Peter here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how about your results compared with artificial work? Artificial work? Uh, to test your, your devices, your results of your devices, and to compare with uh, artificial, pure artificial work. You, you mean the... Yeah, you, you, I mean the artificial work without any device. Ah, yeah, so... Um, so again, that's kind of very, very, very important point is that whenever you show the clinical efficacy of uh, a certain treatment, then you have to sort of create 
So you have to kind of take the gold standard treatment in that particular area and compare your treatment against theirs, right? And and show kind of changes over. over. So um, um, in the stroke study, we had, we had actually done that, and and there are published results out of that. I didn't sort of bring it up here. Um, and and we are we are going to do some of the work with uh, uh, the upper body control as well. So we have a number of these ongoing projects uh, with uh, potential funding from NIH and places like that, which will uh, eventually help us. So yeah, it's, it's 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 a long long work. Perhaps you mentioned previously that, and sorry for that, but in all your studies you show results in <clears throat> short period of time. What happened after, with some of these patients after three or four years? Have you... Uh, no, you haven't followed yet. Okay. Uh, there is not a follow-up on this. Um, what the, all of these clinical studies are very expensive. Right? Uh, if you have to bring in a patient uh, three years later on, there is a lot of, sort of effort involved into that. But then how can you be sure that after a short period of training, these results are going to hold for the rest of his life? No, 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 we, we, we can't claim that. We can't claim that. Yeah. So a lot of times what you do is there's something called a dosing, a repeated dosing. Right? So when you do an intervention, right, there's an effect of the intervention for a short period of time, but then you have to redo the intervention out of the way. So that's how um, that's how typically clinically these things are done as well, right? So if you, if you are kind of working with a physiotherapist, I mean, you would do something and then maybe it will have some good effect, but then you go back again. Um, so so I, we, we can't claim that our thing is not about life. In any of your cases, have you been able to no. review the patients after one or two years? Well, well we, we do anecdotically, but not systematically as a scientific work, right? So we, we it's because all our clinicians are still the clinician for these patients that are coming in. So they, they see the patients over long periods of time. But we cannot sort of claim anything scientifically unless you are able to uh, create yes. that protocol to be able to discuss that. Thank you. So a related question in this direction. So because you have done a lot of this thing and you have talked about moving to portable devices. So what do you think about the future of kind of, you have one system that you bring it to the clinic and they do something, and then as they move on, building systems that can help them maybe at their home or in a smaller setting. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's where the, the field is going. You have to sort of take these interventions to their homes. Right? So, for example, when we try to recruit patients in New York City, people are just not able to come. Right? <laughs> It's an hour-long commute, it's costly, they don't have time, you have family, they have little children, you have other things going on in your life, right? So, you just, these things are very impractical to come to, to a laboratory. So, really, the, 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 the overall goal is sort of getting to their home. But then the question is, how do you know that the things are being used in the correct manner? So, so again, nobody knows the answer to all these things. So, uh, on adding to that, like, uh, moving from um, so, for example, our neck brace would be would be an assistive device, especially for. So, it all depends on the, the condition of the patient. If I have an ALS patient, I know that they're not going to recover from from the disease unless unless medically there is a solution to that, right? Unless people are find, able to find the right drug or a cure for that. Um, um, but on the other hand, we know that stroke patients, right, even many of our patients were like three years post-stroke and, and they were still able to sort of do better than what they were doing earlier on, right? Uh, but, but sometimes it's not practical for them to kind of use that device for, kind of, for extent period of time, right? I mean, aesthetics is the issue, right? Nobody wants to sort of wear something on their neck all the time, right? Yeah. Unless you can make something that is really concealable completely, right? And, and I, that's where I think the future engineers are of many solutions which are functional but transparent. Okay, so applying a force on the on healthy people, for, for example, it's not for uh, rehabilitation, it's for augmented uh, 
uh, exoskeleton. So, for example, if a soldier wear a uh, augmented exoskeleton, for example, for, for a whole day, will it also affect its gait after it is taken off? Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, in fact, there are many studies like that where we really look at um, those kinds of things. In fact, uh, in our group, we have actually studied where people are wearing these uh, backpacks, you know, soldiers with uh, 30 or 40 percent of their body weight on their backpack. And uh, we have done several studies like, like that, how you can sort of create these uh, controlled structures that will allow you to uh, decrease your metabolic cost. But, but of course, I mean, there is a short term and a long term effect of any all of these things. And I, I don't think that I mean, people are going to have a good understanding of it. So, Sunil, I have one final question. Nobody else has any. Um, when you were presenting the early part of the presentation, you were talking about how you had the healthy individuals and you were trying to see if you could change their game by throwing the most mm -hmm. of that. I was thinking, uh, you know, we change our gait based on the environment all the time, right? But I was thinking when I walk on snow or ice, I barely lift my foot, right? That's a sort of a squished gait that you're trying to achieve. If I'm walking in my living room where my you know, six-year-old son has Lego everywhere, I don't want to step on them, then I lift my foot quite a bit. So it's still the sort of same uh, trajectory, same shape, but I lift it. Uh, so I know that as a healthy individual, I can already do different gates uh, and, and I can deploy them temporarily not on a permanent basis. So the, the, was there any like, that kind of thinking that went in when you were doing that study that yeah, so, people, you already know that they can do different Yeah, so, um, so what we try to do is choose a gate template that is not easy to follow. So, um, um, so the choice of this hard template I mean, took some time. And we felt that the template that we had taken was because because here you're not sort of it's not a situation dependent. You're just kind of plain walking, right? And uh, um, and that was a hard task for them to do while ordinarily walking with this long stride and kind of uh, not bending their knees. At all. But but you're right. I mean, of course. I mean, we all are context dependent, and we'll be able to sort of adapt ourselves to that. So I was thinking you could combine your VR thing, right? Where you actually present like snow and ha have people walk, they would be forced to sort of not lift yeah. their foot that much, and then uh, you could sort of you know have them do that gait. So we, we had published a paper where we had these instrumented shoes, but the shoes would give you a sound as if you are walking in different scenarios, right? So even though you're walking on a flat ground, it'll it's, it'll give you sound as if you're walk, walking in sand. Or you're walking in snow, or you're walking in a very on a metal, and uh, uh, and and basically the data shows is that you would actually change your gait to reflect that, even though that's just a sensory input that you're providing to the individual. Yeah, yes, you, you would be right. All right, let's thank Professor Grewal once more. <laughs> so this brings us to the close of the first day of this school. Tomorrow we'll meet the same time in the morning. We have five presenters tomorrow. So we will actually end at 5.30 tomorrow. Uh, and then we'll have another, about 15 minutes to do one wrap up and give you guys the certificate of uh, participation in the summer school. Okay, well, I'll see you guys in the morning tomorrow.